Okay, you're going to have to earn your supper here. Exam question. The fire started, you can see the flames here. This, this, is a, this is a little while after the fire started. And after a certain period of time, that small fire spread to this devastating inferno. Now, my question to the audience tonight is, how long do you think it took to get from this stage to this stage? Was it approximately around about five minutes? Was it less than 10 minutes, less than 20, 40 or 60 minutes? I'd like you to show of hands those of you who think it took about five minutes to get from there to there. Okay, I'm going to note this down. Okay, <laughs> there's about 15. What about 10 minutes? Twenty minutes? Forty minutes? Less than sixty minutes. Okay. Remind me not to be involved in any fires with you people. <laughs> okay, next question. If you were stood in this hall as the fire started, where this chap in the black jacket is standing, if you were stood there, how long do you think you would have to survive in that environment? Approximately two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, twenty minutes, or forty minutes? Show of hands for about two minutes. Five minutes? Less than ten minutes? 20 minutes and less than 40 minutes. No one? Good. Okay, we'll come back to this later on. Okay, I'm going to talk now a bit about computational fire engineering. The past 20 years has seen a dramatic increase in our fundamental scientific understanding of how fire and people subjected to fire behave. This change in our fundamental understanding of fire from this historical empirical perspective, which is where we were uh, a number of years ago, to the scientific predictive perspective has led to two major changes in, 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 in fire engineering. The first is the development of a range of sophisticated models for fire engineering applications, resulting in the birth of a new discipline which I've called computational fire engineering. This is a term that's beginning to catch on, computational fire engineering. It's the use of computational models, computer models, to the fire engineering problem. That's the first thing that's happened. And the second thing that happened is that there's been a paradigm shift. We've moved from how we used to do fire engineering, uh, which was basically looking at having a bunch of rules, prescriptive rules that say, thou shalt do this and thou shalt do that, to... A, uh, this modern approach which we call the performance-based approach. And really all of fire safety engineering today is based around this performance-based approach. And what that is, it's very simple to understand. You basically calculate two numbers. For any fire situation, you calculate two numbers. When you're looking at a design, you sit down with the owner, the fire brigade, the engineers and so on, and you come up with the types of scenarios you expect to, uh, to, you might have in your particular building. And then for those scenarios, you use computer models, a fire model, and you calculate, as the fire develops, you calculate what we call the ASET, or available safe egress time. How much time will people have in this structure given the fires that you've specified? That's the first thing you do. And you use computer models to do this. The second thing you do is you calculate the R set or required safe egress time. How much time is it going to take for all of you people to get out of this uh, compartment? And again, we can use computer models to calculate that time, predict that time. And what we hope we've shown by doing this for our design, we hope that we've got the available safe egress time is greater than the required safe egress time plus a safety factor. Why plus a safety factor? Well, no one believes these models anyway, so you need to add a safety factor in there as well. 
So you want to show that the available time is greater than the required time, plus a margin of safety. And that's basically what fire engineering is all about. What you do with this then, here is a, uh, an airport terminal uh, layout. We've calculated a fire, uh, I'm not naming which airport terminal this is, but we've put a, a fire in a Burger King restaurant and we've set fire and you can see here we've calculated the spread of the smoke and we're calculating here the visibility, how far can you see. And basically where it's red you, can see very, you can't see very far. And then we run, and that gives us an indication, if you like, of how much time is available. Then we run our evacuation model and we see if we can get everyone out before you reach non-tenable conditions. Okay, and non-tenable conditions might be, for example, you'll say, uh, when is the visibility less than five metres, for example? When does a hot layer descend to head height? Things like that. And at this stage, there's no coupling between the two calculations. They're completely separate. Okay? And that's important to understand. They're completely separate. One of the big advances Greenwich has made in this study is we bring them together and we couple them. And I'll talk about that um, a bit later on. But that's essentially what we do in, in uh, fire safety engineering. What I'm now going to talk about are the two sides of that equation, the required safe egress time and the available safe egress time. How do we get these uh, numbers? Okay? We use computer models. I'm going to start off by talking about the evacuation side and before I do that I want to play a little video which um, conveys some of the myths about how people behave because everyone has got uh, a certain idea of how people behave in an emergency situation and I can guarantee you it's usually wrong. If the first thing I ask people when I talk about evacuation, I, I know the first thing that they're thinking about is panic. People panic. This is one of the biggest myths in fire engineering. People don't panic on the whole. And this video, I think, will try and convey some of those myths. This guy's not evacuating. He's waiting to get his cup of coffee. These guys are panicking. Homer re-enters the building to get his prized possessions. Panic. Is it supposed to take this long? What's a good time for a mass evacuation of the entire plant? 45 seconds. And what's our time so far? I don't know, sir. This stopwatch only goes up to 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of slow coaches do I have? What's your body? What are those now? <laughs> okay, Homer goes on. Okay, so that video. Oops. Let me move that on. Okay, that video conveyed a lot of the myths of evacuation behaviour. People, the everyone always says people panic. Um, what it did show, though, was some of the real behaviours. People often re-enter a building that's on fire to save prized possessions. Homer went to save his photograph. People do that. One guy delayed his evacuation because he'd put his 20p, 20 cents, in the coffee machine and he was waiting to get his cup of coffee out. People do that and people have died because of that sort of behaviour. They're real behaviours. Uh, but the notion of panic, people running around, they were actually accurate representations of panic. Panic is what a, what a, what a research psychologist would call panic, is an irrational behaviour that's damaging to the self or to others, a non-adaptive behaviour. And what you see, the myth that you see per perpetrated in the media, whenever there's a disaster, you'll see a picture like this, with a banner over the top, which says, panic. Crowd stampedes. And when you look at that picture, you think, oh yeah, they look, they look like they're panicking, the guy's, his arms flailing about, he's screaming. Okay, but is that a panic reaction? Is that an irrational behaviour that we're seeing? Is it an irrational response? Or is it actually a very rational response to this situation? Now, what you saw on the previous picture was not panic, it's a very rational response. You run away from something like that as quickly as possible. 